Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala eşrafil enbiya ve mursalin. Seyyidina ve Mevlana ve Habibina Muhammed. Ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecma'in. So we're once again embarked on uh, one of these stories about uh, men and women who represent in what turns out to be a huge kaleidoscope of different ways, uh, represents the principle of leadership. We began with the uh, fairly obvious observation that in Islam leadership is not something that we seek because the ego tends to be attached to it. Uh, but that nonetheless people may accept when it is thrust upon them if it is used for the benefit of, of mankind and the spreading of the deen. Uh, what I want, uh, the individual that I want to talk about uh, this evening uh, is one of the great four imams of uh, the fiqh according to the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And this is Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, al-Shaybani. We need to preface our remarks with the reflection that even though nowadays it's second nature to us as Muslims to assume that, yes, there are four Imams, just as there are four Aqtab, and four seems to be a particular number, four of the great Rusul and so forth, uh, four of the perfect women, uh, but nonetheless, the emergence of Islamic law was uh, a much less methodical principle and process that that tidy number might suggest. The great catastrophe in the history of the Ummah happens, of course, uh, in the year 632, when the Holy Prophet dies, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, unexpectedly he returns to his Lord, passes on to al-Rafiq al-A'la, leaving the community in consternation, confusion. Suddenly, the principle that had been amongst them, resolving their disputes, providing them with blessing and holiness, speaking to them of the meaning of life and what is before life and what is after life, the oracle of everything that they needed to know about this world and the next, suddenly was no longer there. But continuity was essential if the individual Muslim souls and the conveyance of the da'wah and the great amr, the politics of the early community, its unity against the polytheistic tribal jahili rivals was to be preserved. In a sense, all of the great ulama of Islam, all of the great leaders of Islam uh, are great insofar as they recognize that what they are doing is attempting to mitigate that initial catastrophe, the great disaster of al-Wafat al-Nabawiyah, the prophetic death, which left some of the Sahaba unable to speak, unable to walk. They were suddenly and calamitously bereaved. But the Ummah had to continue. And the four Khulafa were the ones who held the torch and provided the context for the spiritual continuity and the fiqh continuity and the political stability and legitimacy of the ummah to ride those storms, and they were very grave storms, uh, in order that the message would not be lost. Subsequently, we find all of these great leaders, men and women, saints, scholars, Sufis, intellectuals, Qur'an experts, mujahideen, princes, khulafa. Their greatness in the sight of Allah is measured entirely in terms of their success in reducing and mitigating that catastrophe, the prophetic demise. And in conserving, not just in the forms of people's lives, but in the hearts of the Ummah, the principle of the Sunnah. <coughs> there was ever for you, in Allah's Messenger, an excellent example. 
not the ego-based chest thumping of Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl, nor the mindless pride of the ignorant imperial rulers of the time, nor the wild vengeance-based code of the Bedouin Arabs, but something completely different and completely new, something in line with the fitra, and hence something in which human beings found peace. So this life and this peace which he brought to the Ummah is what the leader of the Ummah always seeks to maintain. Not doing it for his own self, self but for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is said that unlike in the modern academy, where the purpose of the teacher, if it's not just to serve the economy, but is to serve the student, that in the Islamic vision, the function of a scholar is not to serve the student, but to serve truth. And with the students, the teacher preserves the knowledge that has been conserved from the age of prophecy. That is what we serve, we serve truth. And it is the privilege of the bearers of truth to be a link in that chain and safely to take it through the storms of our generation and to pass it on unaltered, unpolluted, uncontaminated to the next generation of believers. But the scholar is not the servant of the student, the scholar is the servant of truth. So these four imams emerge in the context of an ummah that has demonstrated extraordinary intellectual vitality while being restrained in various ways by the need to remain loyal to the prophetic vision, to the sunnah. <coughs> and the people of the sunnah are called Ahlus sunnah wal jama'ah, the people of the sunnah and of the community. And so a scholar is a scholar for the sunnah, for the truth of the sunnah, and for the community. Uh, and in that sense, he is a public figure. The four Imams represent different ways in which the Sahaba, Ridwanullahi alayhim, heard and understood and conveyed the multifaceted brilliance of the prophetic excellence of he who uh, was described as ala khuluqin azim. Verily, you are on a mighty trait of character, the immensity of the prophetic personality, the immensity of the word which he carried, the immense size and profundity and complexity of the legacy of hadith, <coughs> the extraordinary transformation which he brought to the depths of people's hearts, turning wild men into saints. All of that immensity was understood differently by the Sahaba who stood humbly around that great mountain and tried to record it as much as they could. And so the four madhabs represent not random accumulations of early rulings, but rather different visions, different fragrances, different bandwidths in the spectrum cast by the prophetic refraction. And of course, even in the time of the four imams, it was not clear that there were to be four imams. There were others. Imam al-Layth bin Sa'ad, Imam Sufyan, Imam al-Tabari, I guess, Imam al-Awza'i, Abu Thawr and others who had madhabs of their own. Continuing in this way, the fact that amongst the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, there were madhabs. The Imam that uh, it is our privilege to speak about this evening is the Imam who was reached by a particular possibility amongst the Salaf that was intensely concerned to maintain the plainness of the revelation without the possibility of contamination by human deduction. And this reflects a necessary argument. To what extent can the mind autonomously determine truth, values, ethics, laws? To what extent is it something that can only be known safely through revelation? The Ahl sunnah by being the Ahl sunnah conclude that the source of knowledge is revelation. But they take different views on the extent to which reason can interpret that revelation. What if there are difficulties in understanding a hadith? What if there are difficulties in reconciling different hadiths that seem to be saying different things? 
What if there are difficulties involved in squaring the reports of the Sahaba with what seems to be in the Hadith? What if there are linguistic arguments? There's plenty of ways in which the mind is indispensable. The scholar is not some kind of database. The scholar is a complete human being with a great processing capacity. So uh, Al-Imam Ahmad radiallahu anhu and the Hanabila who followed him were amongst those scholars who took the view that one needs to be uh, skeptical <clears throat> about the capacity of reason to work things out unaided and to try and follow the scripture to the extent that one can by looking at its outward plain sense. <clears throat> this turned out to be a minority interpretation amongst the ulama. It's part of the greatness of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah that unlike other religions where there was an insistence on following just one interpretation. At one point in the Christian Middle Ages there were three different popes fighting each other, but in Islam the Imams don't fight each other but respect each other. The ikhtilaf is regarded as something that is due to the intensity of their sincerity in following the Sunnah according to their understanding of the Sunnah. So, Imam Ahmad radiallahu an has not been followed by as many as have followed Imam Malik or Imam Shafi'i or Imam Abu Hanifa. But, in, but nonetheless, because of the breadth and wisdom of the Sunni tradition, his position has always been uncontroversially regarded as a valid one. And this is part of the greatness of Islam. Ahlul Ilm, Ahlul Tawsi'ah, the people of scholarship are people who try to make things broad. Uh, so there has always been this possibility in Islam of following, we wouldn't call it a fundamentalism, which is a loaded term, but rather a uh, firm determination to follow the plain sense of scripture, uh, irrespective of what ratiocination might determine. Another thing that we find with the madhab of Imam Ahmad, and it's related to this, is that he took immense care to maintain not only the athar, the akhbar, the hadiths and the sayings of the early Muslims, but also the spirit of those texts. This is not a superficial interpretation of Islam. And as we'll see as we progress to the story of this great imam, he was, of all of the four imams, the one who is closest to the Sufis and the one who loved to keep their company, and also of the four imams, the one of whom we have most reports preserved of his uh, awareness of the sanctity of anything connected with the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when he was buried, he insisted that the three hairs from the Holy Prophet's head, which he had conserved um, for their blessing, would be buried with him, one on each eye, one on his lips. And his son uh, conserved many very moving accounts of his tremendous reverence for anything that was a relic of the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So not some kind of superficial uh, latter-day fundamentalist with no idea of holiness, but somebody who conserved the hadith because he knew the spiritual greatness of the one uh, who the hadith is describing. We have plenty of information about his life. We know that he was born in the year 164, that's pretty uh, well known, and died in the year 241. We know that his mother was from the town of Mar, which is in Central Asia, uh, and came to Baghdad when she was pregnant with Al Imam Ahmad. And on both sides of his family, he is of Arab stock, unlike, say, Imam Abu Hanifa, who is of Persian origin. Uh, from uh, the Shaybani tribe, a tribe well known for their uh, martial virtues and for their high aspiration, for their himma. Um, uh, the home of the family was somewhere around what's now Basra, but probably a bit south of it. So sometimes you hear Kuwaitis boasting of the fact that Ahmed bin Hanbal grew up in Kuwait. Um, which is not unlikely, of course, the name <coughs> and the country were uh, not in existence at the time, but that's the kind of region. Uh, Sayyidina Omar, radiallahu an, had built um, the great city of Basra. The Sahaba and the early Khulafa were great civilizers, builders of cities. Kufa, 
full stop, uh, and, uh, and Basra, Wasit, other places. So sometimes Imam Ahmed is called Al Basri because that's the kind of area where he grew up. And certainly when he went to Basra, he would always make sure that he would pray in the mosque of, of Mazin in Basra. Su'ila an dhalika faqal innahu masjidu abai. He was asked about that and he said, <coughs> it's the mosque of my ancestors. Uh, his father, uh, Muhammad, uh, was a soldier. Some say an officer, so he remembers how he would see his father sometimes wearing kind of military clothes or armor. But he never really saw him uh, because his father died young at the age of about 30. But his father manages to leave the family a small property in Baghdad, which generates an income which <coughs> uh, covers <coughs> the family's needs subsequently. Although, as we'll see, Imam Ahmad was one of the imams who have really preferred asceticism and, and a simple life of, of poverty. So being an orphan in this way gave him a kind of sense of self-reliance and accustomed him to a life of poverty. Um, and uh, he's similar in this respect to Imam al-Shafi'i. Good lineage combined with poverty lead to a certain type of, of human nobility. And this is probably one reason why in later life he was so intensely drawn to the company of the Zuhad, the ascetics, and of the Sufis. Moves to Baghdad. Baghdad is really the centre of the Islamic world, the greatest city in the world at the time. Um, Every tendency, of course, is present. Uh, every possible sect and denomination, every possible religion is there. It's a kind of uh, microcosm of the, of, of the planet. Uh, he engages in the usual traditional studies, so he memorizes the Holy Qur'an. He is a master of the Arabic language um, uh, and would spend a certain amount of time in the kind of royal uh, bureaucratic offices, the diwan, uh, the scriptorium. Um, one of his tasks quite often there was to uh, uh, read soldiers' letters to their wives and write down their replies. These were soldiers who were not able to read and write. And one of the things we find in the lives of all of the four Imams is that they were very connected to the reality of ordinary people's lives. These are not ivory tower uh, academics. These are people who are really determined to understand the reality of the people for whom they're giving fatwas. One of the senior scribes said, we're told, in If this young man lives long enough, he will be a proof for the whole people of, of, of his age. It was clear that there was a tremendous future uh, in wait for him. So many things could be studied in Baghdad, from astronomy to mathematics to inheritance law to royal administration, uh, irrigation, but he chose Dean. And in Dean, of course, there were different tracks. There was the track of fiqh and also the track of hadith. You could say those are the two main uh, subdivisions. And Iraq, of course, already contained the madhab of uh, Abu Yusuf and Shaybani, the two great inheritors of Abu Hanifa. And it's said sometimes that his first teacher was uh, Abu Yusuf. Uh, but soon he switches and prefers Hadith, and he becomes known particularly uh, as a great uh, scholar and uh, assessor and compiler of Hadith. Sometimes people say he's just a Muhaddith and doesn't know Fiqh, but that's wrong. Uh, we have plenty of accounts from his contemporaries indicating that uh, he did study fiqh. His pupil al-Khalal, for instance, said he studied fiqh, walakin lam yaltafit ilayh. He didn't give it much attention, but, but he knew it. Until the year 186, he continues writing the hadiths that are available in the hadith circles of Baghdad. Then he goes to Basra to learn more hadiths there. And in the following year, he goes to the Hijaz, and then to Yemen. And all of this is the traditional rihla fi talab al-hadith, the traveling in search of hadith. Um, and then returns to Baghdad three more years, 
um, and makes further trips to the Hajj. We're told that he made the Hajj five times altogether. Three times he went walking. Uh, in the Hijaz, he meets uh, Imam al-Shafi'i, whom he sees in Baghdad as well. Remember, these four Imams, they're kind of, even though the generations, you know, it's a stretch period, more than 100 years, but still they are part of the same intellectual community. And Imam Shafi'i uh, respected his views absolutely in hadith and would frequently consult him. إِذَا صَحَّ عِنْدَكُمُ الْحَدِيثِ فَأَعْلِمْنِي بِهِ So he would say to Imam Ahmad, if you think a hadith is sound, teach it to me. Um, so we have this image of this enthusiast for hadith, this lover of hadith, and you can only really understand that when you think that you know, hadith is a difficult discipline based on long isnads and the memorization of inconceivable quantities of material. And how could a young man be so focused just on that that he, he, through the hadith, he saw the chosen one, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Each hadith fills in a piece of the jigsaw, and the more of the jigsaw you have, you see the face of the Mustafa alayhi salatu wasalam. It's the holy prophet that they're seeking. They want to overcome that catastrophe of the prophetic death and to help the ummah as much as possible and to serve the ilm, to serve the knowledge. So this accounts for the extraordinary enthusiasm. He wanted to go to some other places, to the east. He wanted to go to Rai, but he simply couldn't afford it. We're told that on some of his journeys, he would sleep on a brick. Um, uh, he went to Yemen because he needed some hadiths from there. He couldn't afford any kind of, even a donkey, and he walked all the way to Yemen. On the way, and while he was there, he ran out of money and had to look for work. So he was working with some porters, people who were just carrying things. أَكْرَى نَفْسَهُ مِنْ بَعْضِ الْحَمَّالِينَ إِلَىٰ أَنْوَافَ صَنْعَىٰ The historians say he just hired himself out to some porters until he reached Sanaa, so he's just carrying whatever for a few coins just to keep him going. Uh, he did this because it was his principle out of his uh, sense of dignity and appropriateness in Deen that because he was doing these things for scholarship, he didn't want anybody to pay him or subsidize him. So even if he was traveling with a group of people, and they saw that he was hungry, he wouldn't accept any money from them. He would go off and find a job of some kind. He goes to Sana'a to get hadith from the great Imam Abdul Razak, one of the great early hadith uh, narrators, the author of the Musannaf. And again, Abdul Razak sees this guy is in rags, he's thin, and the Imam wants to help him with some money. Ya Aba Abdullah, khud hadha shay'a فَانْتَفِعْ بِهِ فَإِنَّ أَرْضَنَا لَيْسَتْ بِأَرْضِ مَتْجَرْ وَلَا مَكْسَبْ وَمَدَّ إِلَيْهِ بِدَنَانِيرْ فَقَالَ أَحْمَدْ أَنَا بِخَيْرْ So, Abdul Razak says to this <laughs> starving student, uh, take this thing and benefit from it, because our land is not a land in which people can easily earn or trade. And he handed him some coins, but Ahmad just said, I'm fine, I'm all right, Anna Bikhair. So in Sana'a, he stays in intense poverty for two years, he, hearing hadiths from Ibn al Musayyab, from Imam al Zuhri, from that line, and from Imam uh, Abdul Razak. Uh, and he continues to travel, and he is said to have had a box. And he would travel, walk these huge distances with a box on his back which had his books in it. And people would comment on this. And he never stopped studying and taking his books with him, even when he became the great Imam of Baghdad, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. Uh, he was asked why he just couldn't stop ever writing down hadiths. And he said, Ma al mahbara il al maqbara. I'm with my ink pot until I go to the hole in the ground, the, the grave. It rhymes in Arabic. He's living in what's called the Asr al-Tadween, the age in which 
the writing down of hadith is becoming a huge flourishing activity of the civilization. Um, even though he'd memorized his hadiths, he would only teach them from a physical text, from a book. Um, even if he knew something <laughs> and didn't have the book, he would write the hadith down and then teach from that piece of, of writing. This was his style of teaching. Um, he got to meet all kinds of different people, especially traveling around in Iraq, which was this amazingly cosmopolitan place where you could meet people from every possible denomination. It said that he spoke Farsi quite well. Um, and some of his family were in Khorasan and occasionally would visit him and he could speak to them in, in Farsi. So again, a cosmopolitan person, not some kind of limited monk. Um, so he's basically just doing this. He doesn't hear from Imam Malik, Imam Ibn al-Mubarak and some other very early transmitters because they just died too soon. And then he's still not teaching. He passes the age of 30, 35, doesn't teach hadith. At the age of 40, his life changes. He sits down and he becomes the great muhaddith, the great hadith teacher. Jalatha li tahdith. Because he was following the Quranic uh, verse about maturity. Hatta idha balagha ashuddahu. So that at the age of 40, one reaches one's full maturity. And this was from his scrupulousness. He knew the enormous amana, the responsibility of teaching the prophetic legacy, and he wanted to make sure that he was doing this in his prime and a time of real maturity. Um, So by this time, he's finally got his, his circle in Baghdad. He's already famous. Even when he was just collecting hadiths and hearing isnads, he had a reputation. So when he finally sat down in Baghdad to teach, huge crowds came. It said sometimes 5,000 people would come just to hear some hadiths from him. And people would come from, from all over. And this is said to be one reason why his uh, hadith spread very widely, because there were just so many people there um, to listen to them. It's recorded that not everybody <coughs> attended these sessions just to memorize some hadiths. Some of them came because of his famous spiritual presence. It was a very holy, sacred, Mubarak environment, his session. So Ibn al jawzi great later historian, reports of one in the audience, اِخْتَلَفْتُ إِلَىٰ أَبِي عَبْدِ اللَّهِ أَحْمَدْ بِنْ حَنْبَلْ إِثْنَتَيْ عَشَرَةَ سَنَةً وَهُوَ يَقْرَأُ الْمُسْنَدَ عَلَىٰ أَوْلَادِهِ فَمَا كَتَبْتُ مِنْهُ حَدِيثًا وَاحِدًا وَإِنَّمَا كُنْتُ أَمِيلُ إِلَىٰ هَدِهِ وَأَخْلَاقِهِ وَآدَابِهِ So somebody who was present said, I used to go to Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal regularly for 12 years while he was teaching the Musnad to his children. <coughs> but I didn't write down a single hadith. I only went because of the guidance that he was given, giving the akhlaq that he showed and the adab. And just observing the beauty of the man as he taught in this ascetical, God-filled way that was a spiritual transformation for this person. It was his habit to teach the most able students in his house, uh, but also to give these enormous public lectures in the mosque in Baghdad, uh, usually after the Asr prayer. That was his, his life. His sessions were also famous for their, their gravitas. Mm -hmm. Remember Imam Malik used to take a ghusl before uh, sitting to give hadith. Imam Ahmad never in his life was reported to have told anything like a joke in his classes. Never said anything humorous or witty. 
Mm -hmm. because he considered his classes to be worship and one should not be light-hearted during a bada. So it's an intensely intense, uh, serious environment. One of his pupils recalled, لم يرى فقير مجلسا أعز منه في مجلس أبي عبد الله. I've never seen a more precious or unusual gathering than the majlis of Imam Ahmad. كان فيه حلم ولم يكن بالعجول بل كان كثير التواضع تعلوه السكينة والوقار إذا جلس مجلسه بعض العصر لا يتكلم حتى يسأل. He had tremendous mildness never went too fast, was extremely humble, was dominated by tranquility and dignity. And when, in the afternoons, after the Asr prayer, he sat down for his majlis, he wouldn't speak until somebody asked him a question. It was this kind of dignified state, and people would venture to ask him a question, then he would speak. So in these sessions, uh, we're told that he would do two different things. Firstly, he would be dictating hadith. Secondly, he would be giving fatwas and judgments of various kinds. He wouldn't allow anybody to write these down. And it said that's because he didn't want to see anything written which contained his own fatwas. That was his tradition. So everything seems to be going fine for him. He's this king of the scholars in Baghdad. Uh, this incredibly holy person. But then the great catastrophe of his life happens, which is what's known in Islamic history as the Mihna. Mihna is like an inquisition. <coughs> Baghdad, despite being the center of the world, is also the center of many of the fitness of the world, as well as different kinds of Shia. You have uh, rationalists, you have the beginnings of Arabic philosophy, you have the Mu'tazila, uh, and this argument between aql and naql, reason and the transmitted text of revelation, is kind of pulling the city apart. Uh, and this comes to a head with this event known as the, the Mihna. This begins with the Abbasid Caliph al Ma'mun and continues with his two immediate successors, Al-Mu'tasim and Al-Wathiq. <coughs> Ma'mun <coughs> may not have been a card-carrying member of the Mu'tazilite sect, but he certainly was convinced of the idea that somehow Allah's book, the Qur'an, is something new that's, that's created. Uh, this is an idea that had appeared earlier in the Umayyad period that's associated with somebody called Ja'ab bin Dirham, Ja'ab bin Safwan. Effectively, a denial of the divine attribute of speech. Mu'tazilites didn't think that God speaks. It's an anthropomorphism and also it suggests that there's been something with God uh, before, you know, Anything existed, and this creates a kind of cluster of entities rather than a single, single one God. So the Mu'tazilites said, for the sake of Tawheed, we have to say that the Qur'an comes into being in time, and there was a time when it just wasn't around. So the Mu'tazilites, on this argument, and this is one of the you know, more understandable doctrines, start to gain in strength in the city of Baghdad. They infiltrate the entourage of the Caliph, and Ma'mun seems to kind of be interested in this, this idea. Uh, sometimes Abu Hashim, the great uh, Mu'tazilite theologian, said that uh, Ma'mun would almost stand up when he came in. So in the year 212 of the Hijra, an official caliphal proclamation goes out saying that the official doctrine is the Khalq al-Qur'an, the createdness of the Qur'an. This is an official doctrine, but at first it's not kind of imposed. That comes in 218, when the scholars obviously are not buying the strange idea, and the caliph tries to physically impose it forcibly, and gets his soldiers and his entourage and the city police to require the fuqaha and the hadith scholars to subscribe to it. <coughs> and those who don't are told that their testimony won't be accepted in courts of law, they can't hold any kind of public office like a judgeship. So they're kind of 
cancelled, we'd say nowadays. Uh, everybody's views on this is assembled in a huge book which is sent to Matt Morn who looks through it and then orders ultimately that dissidents, if they won't change their view, should be arrested, threatened with execution. This is very unusual in Islamic history because the caliph doesn't really have the authority to do that. For all of the Western polemical talk about Islam and theocracy, the reality is that the ruler doesn't really have much religious authority. His name is on the coinage, it's recited in the khutbah, he can declare jihad, he is responsible in some way for the establishment of the hudud, but he can't really interfere in or impose a theological or fiqhi perspective. That's God's business, as interpreted by the ulama. So he's doing something that's rather strange, and it's the only example of a major... Uh, doctrinal dispute attempting to be resolved in Islamic history through force. Nowadays all of the regimes are trying to correct the masses, aqidah or whatever, but this is not the function of the state historically. But Mahmoud seems to have thought it was. So the scholars threatened with execution kind of say that they accept this new teaching or they have some way of finessing it so that they can get away with it. But some of them refuse and they are arrested, beaten up, thrown into jail. Um, one of these is Imam al-Bouaiti, uh, an associate of a Shafi'i, a very uh, rigorous and beloved scholar who actually dies in prison. Uh, Nu'aym bin Hamad, another hadith expert, also dies. Um, Ma'mun is on campaign during this strange period, place called Tarsus, northern Syria, and claps his hand and says, let all of the scholars um, come to me, whether they're free or whether they're in chains. Yeah. So they're going to this kind of council en route. The angel of death gets there first, and the caliph dies. But before he dies, he tells his brother Mu'tasim to maintain this policy. خُذْ بِسِيرَةِ أَخِيكَ فِي خَلْقِ الْقُرْآنِ this is probably now more in the hands of his chief uh, wazir, Ahmed bin Abi Du'ad, who is a dyed-in-the-wool convinced Mu'tazilite, um, who tries to impose this thing on the scholars. And this idea, the Quran came into being, is created, was written, and put above all of the doors of the mosques in the empire so that people would have to sort of walk beneath them. It's very difficult in Islam to use religion or liturgy to impose a doctrine. Remember, at the time of the English Reformation in this country, uh, the, church, the state was at liberty to change the form of worship. So the Apostles' Creed had to be read in all of the churches under Henry VIII and Elizabeth I, and it was obligatory to go to church. So if you didn't accept some of the things in the Apostles' Creed, you could be arrested because they could just change their ibadah. In Islam, you can't do that. <laughs> no matter how outrageous the khalifa, he can't say, please pray now in a different way and insert something. So the only way in which the state can really impose a doctrine is by these strange maneuvers of threatening the scholars or putting up big signs in the mosque announcing this new doctrine, but they can't, they can't really press it into the heart of, of religion. Their power is very limited. So a Mu'tasim, who's a soldier more interested in uh, uh, battles, allows this Ibn Abi Du'ad, this vizier, to continue with this policy. Um, Imam Ahmed is in prison in Baghdad, uh, and they're deciding what to do with him. He's asked to repent again. The caliph's messenger says, just, just say something. Uh, it's embarrassing for the sultan. Just say something, but he refuses. And Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal is flogged repeatedly uh, and is in jail for 18 months. And he will not shift. He won't say anything other than the Qur'an is God's speech. God has always had speech. So after these 18 months, you know, when the masses are really pretty sympathetic to the Imam, they let him out again. And he hasn't changed his position. Immediately, Although his sick and wounded from being flogged for so long, 
he goes to the mosque, sits in his mosque, but until he's better, his wounds have healed, he doesn't teach. And then, when his wounds are just scars, which he carries for the rest of his life, he begins again, Imam Ahmad Mahanbal, teaching hadith in his mosque. Mu'tasim dies, al wathiq the new caliph, still can't get out of this rut, starts this inquisition again, but not so violently. <coughs> uh, Ibn Abi Du'ad manages to get Ibn Hanbal kind of under house arrest, just waits there until al wathiq dies. So there's a period of about five years until 232, when Imam Ahmad is, is not teaching. Finally, al wathiq dies, Imam Ahmad has not changed his position. The whole city turns out to welcome uh, Imam Ahmad as he goes in triumph to the mosque to teach hadith again. It's a, a great moment in the life of the city. And you have to remember that those were times when the scholars recognised that they need to be independent of the state, even if it meant that they got flogged. This is just the way of the, uh, of the ulama. Uh, They are the representatives of the people uh, to the ruler, not the other way around. In Christianity, it's the other way around because the bishop crowns the king and the institution of the church is linked to the royal family, and together they rule. In Islam, the triangle works differently. The ruler is there, but the scholars are with the masses and represent the masses to the Sultan, I was reading just yesterday in the life of Muhyiddin ibn Arabi. <laughs> he was once in Seville and went to a dinner with his disciples and accepting hospitality. Muslim culture is a big thing. And his host says, thank you, Ahlan wa sahlan. Uh, I'd really like you to tell the ruler about uh, a favour that I'd like to be done because something wrong has been done and I'd like him to, to sort that out. And Ibn Arabi agrees, but doesn't stay for the meal and takes his disciples out. Why is that? Because he doesn't want to be beholden to anybody. He's going to go to the Sultan, going to tell him to sort himself out, but he's not going to be paid for that. That's the, that's the way the Olamat used to be, absolute detachment and concern for the masses. So, we have the Imam still not accepting payment. So sometimes he would go out into the countryside, the Sawad around Baghdad, and ask for permission once the harvest had been brought in, to see if he could walk around and find any grains of wheat that had been left behind, so he would be, be gleaning after the harvest. Sometimes this great imam would earn a bit of money just by working as a copyist. He didn't have photocopiers then, so he'd get somebody to write things up. Uh, sometimes he worked as a weaver, did not accept gifts from caliphs or from governors, uh, and he really didn't like it if his students or his colleagues ever accepted gifts, particularly from people in political authority. The modern idea of the kind of state mufti with his limousine would have been, you know, for him, the opposite of Islam. Uh, and this, of course, is one way in which the ulama retain the love of the masses and incentivize the masses to practice religion. They have confidence in their leaders. Uh, Once Imam Shafi'i went to him with a message from the ruler saying, uh, we would like to appoint you to be a qadi, a judge in Yemen. Mm. Uh, But Imam Ahmad refused to do it because the salary (coughs) was from the ruler and might contain some shubha. Perhaps the money from the state contained money that had been taken from people unjustly through unlawful taxation or from bribes or all kinds of corrupt uh, sources of income flow into the coffers of the state. And this again was one of the ways of particularly these ulama who are engaging with the Sufis in the state of Wara and and Muhasaba that they don't want 
anything to come into their bellies that is bought with money that might have come from extortion of any kind. So to this day, in the city of Istanbul, the Sufis love to pray their Juma in the mosque of Sultan Bayezid. Maybe not the Blue Mosque or the other mosque, Sultan Bayezid. Why is that? All of the sultans knew that their income came from dubious sources very often. Sultan Bayezid, when he built his mosque, said, I'm going to make sure that the money that is used to build my sultanic mosque will absolutely only be from morally correct sources. There'll be no expropriation or stuff that I've taken from my enemies or bribes or anything like that, only halal money. And from that time to this, the Salihin of Istanbul have liked to pray their Juma in that uh, Bayezid mosque and to be Imam of the Bayezid mosque. And why is there something that is a source of particular pride for the, uh, for the pure hearted? And I know scholars there who maintain that tradition. It's still very much, very much alive. Uh, so, incidentally, Imam Ahmed is not doing it for himself, but he, he doesn't consider it haram to take a state salary. This is from his wara. He's not going to say there's some ruling in the sharia that proves that you can't be a judge and take money from the local governor. That's not there. But he's not going to do it himself because of this wara. Wara means scrupulousness. So, in the city of Baghdad, this scrupulousness, this muhasaba, this asceticism, this holiness, comes uh, uh, really in tandem with his great love for the Sufis. And I mentioned that <coughs> more than the other great imams, he is particularly concerned to spend time with them. In particular, he loved Ma'ruf al-Karhi, who is buried in Baghdad and is one of the, the, the great uh, Aulia of Baghdad, he was originally a Christian, converted to Islam, and worker of miracles, um, and uh, really a great, a great individual. Sometimes somebody, somebody went to Imam Ahmad and said, this Ma'ruf is a convert, he doesn't have much ilm. Imam Ahmad became angry and said, is true knowledge anything other than what Ma'ruf has achieved? Hadith and so forth, 100,000 hadith is memorized, 200, who knows? But real knowledge is the direct knowledge of your creator. Hadith is something that needs to be done and gives you the fragrance of the chosen one, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But real ma'rifah, knowledge of God, that's an end in itself, not a means to an end. Um, he also loved uh, the Sufis because of their murabata. This was a practice in medieval Islam that you would spend some time, maybe every year, at the front line defending the Darul Islam from the Byzantines in most cases. You'd go to Ribat, a frontier fortress, maybe on some frozen hilltop somewhere in Asia Minor to defend the Darul Islam. And Ma'ruf al-Karhi was famous for this. Bishr al-Hafi also, Bishr the Barefoot, a uh, great saint of Baghdad, was also known as the great... Uh, Mujahid and, and Murabit. Uh, yeah, Bishr al-Hafi, always useful to remember these people, and Imam Ahmed is always zealous to keep their company. Um, even though Bishr it was a uh, Hanafi in his madhab, and Imam Dara Qutni praises him for the reliability of his hadith uh, narrators. He calls him Jabal, Thiqa, a mountain. It's a kind of technical term in describing the the, the immensity of a scholar's knowledge, thiqa, reliable. But Bishr al-Hafi, mainly known today as one of the great Sufis of, of Baghdad. Um, once Bishr met a drunkard on the road who a drunk came up to him, hugged him, said, Yes, yeah, Sayyidi, O oh my master. Bishr, according to the eyewitnesses, doesn't push him away. You know, us, if a drunk came up to me in Cambridge and hugged me, I said, oh, get away. Bishar doesn't do that and allows him to hug him and kiss him and lets him finish till he gets fed up. And then Bishar starts to cry. People are watching this weird event. His eyes fill with tears and he cries and he says, a man, here is a man who loves another man because he thinks there's some good in him. 
but perhaps the lover is saved while the one who is loved is unsure about his final destination. So he's not embarrassed by the encounter, still less does he become all superior about it. He's just moved that the man has loved him, even though Bishop thinks that he himself is not worthy of that love. So he's kind of humbled by this man's love. <laughs> We've changed a lot, but this is how they were. And these are the people Imam Ahmad loved. His Zahid, we mentioned, but of course, the mar marriage is a sunnah. So he marries, it seems, twice. Uh, his first wife is Umm Abi Abbasa, who bears him his son Saleh. She dies under sad circumstances and then marries another woman, an Arab woman called Rayhana. She is the mother of the better known Abdullah bin Ahmed bin Hanbal. She too dies. And he says, may Allah have mercy upon her. We lived together for 20 years and we never quarreled once. That was it. After that, he didn't marry again. Yeah, so in his home life, he was also this exemplary person. Uh, he is also in Baghdad promoting the correct belief about uh, how you assess other people. Since the time of the early fitness, this has been a divisive issue. What about those Sahaba who took opposing sides? What about the Khawarij? What about the Mu'tazila? Who's a believer, who's not a believer? This has big implications because it means who you can marry, inheritance. Uh, it's a life or death issue. Um, his belief is that the Sahib al-Kabira, the person of mortal sins, is still a believer. For the Kharijites, they said, a person who commits a mortal sin is an unbeliever. You commit murder or adultery or something, you're kafir. That's the Kharijite position. Hassan al-Basri had said such a person can be judged to be a munafiq. Mu'tazilites had this strange idea of there being a kind of space between belief and unbelief. The manzila bain al manzilatain. A person could be called a Muslim, but not really. So he's... Uh, we call him a Muslim, but he's still going to hell forever because the Mu'tazilite logic was that if you deliberately disobey God in a matter of mortal sin, God's going to send you to hell and has to because he's just, and in their view, his justice means that he has to punish sinners. The Mu'tazilite God is very kind of constrained by these abstract ideas of what he can and can't do, which is one reason really why the Ummah eventually walked away from their position. For the four Imams, a mortal sinner is still a believer and what happens to him in the afterlife is left to Allah. So Imam Ahmad says, لَا نَشْهَدُوا عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ الْقِبْلَىٰ بِعَمَلٍ يَعْمَلُهُ بِجَنَّةٍ وَلَا بِنَارٍ نَرْجُوا لِلصَّالِحِ وَنَخَافُوا عَلَىٰ الْمُسِيءِ الْمُذْنِبِ وَنَرْجُوا لَهُ رَحْمَةَ اللَّهِ This is Imam Ahmad's position. It's the position of Sunni Islam. We do not judge anybody to be in heaven or hell because of any action that they do. We have hopes for the righteous person. We are fearful for the unrighteous person who commits sins, but we still hope that Allah's mercy will prevail in his case. So this is part of the the beauty and the inclusivity of Sunni Islam, that the true believer is naturally repelled by the idea of making takfir of anyone. And the person of weak iman, or the heretic, or the khariji, or the munafiq, is very quick to say, this is wrong, this is kufr. Uh, uh, and that's one of the hallmarks of the traditional scholar, um, real, real reluctance to say uh, that anybody is kafir. <coughs> How did he do his fiqh? After all, so far our account has apparently been of a hadith scholar, but he's the founder of a madhab, which is a madhab of fiqh. So what's characteristic of his fiqh that becomes al-fiqh al-hanbali? He used to like to begin his fatwas with the word haddathana. In other words, he's going to begin with a hadith. He was famous for that. If on an issue that he was asked about, he couldn't find a hadith. 
he would find if the Sahaba ever had an ijma, a unanimous position amongst themselves. If they took different views, or there wasn't anything evident in their views, he would take a view from the Tabi'in, the disciples of the Sahaba. Or sometimes <coughs> a view from an early scholar such as Malik or al awzai in particular. If there's nothing to contradict it, he will accept a mursal or even a weak hadith, that is to say the one that's disconnected in its chain in a particular way, or a weak hadith. But that hadith can't contradict the verdict of a companion. So because of this strong hadith-centeredness, the Hanbalis are more inclined to find as many hadiths as they can, even if they don't meet the full degree of authenticity um, than the other madhabs. And this is why a lot of modern fundamentalists, when they study Imam Ahmad's way, don't really like him because he seems to you know, find ways of using weak hadiths, which very often they will uh, refuse. Imam Ahmad's madhab and his fiqh has been more seriously and dangerously misunderstood than the madhab and the fiqh of any of the other Sunni imams. So for Imam Ahmad, the word sunnah means the hadith, including weak hadith, and the fatwas of the sahaba. What about qiyas and logical deduction? Can you look to see what is the reason for a prohibition that is present in scripture and use that reason in order to deduce a fatwa for a case that's not present in scripture. Um, he says you can, and the Hanbalis allow sorts of analogical deduction, but only if absolutely necessary, unlike the Hanafis who tend to use Qiyas in their Ijtihad very considerably. There's something also very practical about his fiqh. He doesn't like the iftirad, the supposition. Hmm? What if? He's, he will only give a fatwa on something that has actually occurred, unlike, say, the madhab of Abu Hanifa. Um, he doesn't allow any kind of ijtihad or qiyas or rationality in anything that's to do with worship as such, with ibadat. But in mu'amalat, public law, public transactions, uh, he would actually allow a good deal of latitude. This idea we have of the Hanbalis as being strict isn't really accurate at all. Um, so the basis for the ruling of things in Ibadah is that everything is forbidden unless you can find a text that indicates that you can do this thing. Whereas in ordinary human transactions, relations, deals and so forth, the basis of them is that they are sound unless you can find a text or possibly a qiyas uh, that indicates that those things are forbidden. So actually the Hanbali method turns out to be quite flexible, particularly when relating to issues that are new, for which there isn't a hadith. So a lot of fatwas in modern Islamic banking, for instance, are actually from the Hanbali position <coughs> because of this idea that things, unless they're explicitly forbidden, are just fine. Some of the ulama would say that, that as humanity moves away from the world covered by the hadith, uh, uh, humanity encounters more and more different situations, will actually mean that religion has less and less to say to those situations. It's new, it's not in the hadith, it's kind of mubah, but that's a generalization because on important issues, the Hanbalis will always struggle to find some kind of text-based uh, reason to have an ijtihad, rather than just leaving it as a kind of secular space. <laughs> if there's no nas, though, no text uh, on an issue, he will often seek to determine the maslaha or the public interest. Uh, rather like Malik does, but possibly a little bit less. And of course, Malis, Malik's focus on the practice of the people of Medina is not something that is central to Imam Ahmed's system. But here again, when we have the stereotype of the Hanbalis as being irrational and just text-based, in order to determine where the public interest is, what is the maslaha, you need some kind of rational analysis of that thing. Is it in the interests of the ummah that there should be sharia-compliant hedge funds, for instance? <laughs> just suppose anybody would be weird enough to ask such a question. 
Uh, Imam Ahmad wouldn't say, it's just mubah, not mentioned in that. He'd say, where's the maslaha? Where is the interest? And determining that interest does involve the Hanbali thinkers necessarily in a certain amount of, of, of ratiocination and reasoning it out. But there is a, a wing of the Hanbalis represented famously by somebody called Najmadin Tawfi, a later Egyptian Hanbali, which takes the view that just about anything in Sharia can be adjusted or defined if you can figure out where public interest lies. So quite a lot of modern reformers like to use Najmuddin Tawfi and that type of Hanbalism. So again, we have to get away from the idea that this is a super strict madhab, that these are fundamentalists, um, and into a, a rather different and more nuanced understanding. Uh, I mentioned his tremendous love of the Chosen One, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was really a follower of the inward as well as the outward sunnah. This is one reason for his love of the Sufis, because he saw in them the holiness of Islam rather than just the outward compliance. Uh, he had a particular attachment to the city of Medina. Um, I mentioned uh, the fact that he asked to be buried with three hairs from the Holy Prophet. His son Abdullah reported a lot of things that he'd seen in his father. He used to keep, for instance, a hair from the beard of the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sometimes put it in water, uh, take it out and then drink uh, the water for the blessings. In the city of Medina, the bowl, qasa, from which the Holy Prophet used to drink, was conserved. When he passed through Medina, he would ask to see it and would take barakah by drinking from it himself. Um, so uh, we're getting now, I think, what is a rather different image of this great imam uh, from the conventional one that says the Hanbalis kind of lead on to Ibn Taymiyyah, and Ibn Taymiyyah leads on to Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab leads on to ISIS, and it's all from this. That's not the case at all. Um, real scholars on the madhab of Imam Ahmad and traditional Hanbalis would say, we have nothing to do with any of that stuff. This is a madhab of mercy and of prophetic love and of closeness to, the, to Allah's people, to the awliya. But before we finish, we should, of course, think a little bit about the greatest book that Imam Ahmad left us with, which is, he wrote several books, or compiled several books, including his Kitab al-Zuhud, which is a very useful collect connection of, of hadiths, mainly about renunciation and leaving dunya. Uh, but his great book, of course, is his famous Musnad, which is one of the eight or so really great hadith collections, and very important for all of the madhabs, um, and really a, a brilliant monument of scholarship. Alhamdulillah, the uh, Sunnah project, which has connections here in Cambridge and Azhar as well, brought out quite recently a complete new edition of the Musnad of Ahmad bin Hanbal, um, the first really good edition that there's ever been. They found hadiths that are in the earliest manuscripts that hadn't been published before, unfortunately, because of the decadence of so much Middle Eastern publishing. But this is, we have it in our library at CMC, really beautiful, respectful way of honouring the legacy of Imam Ahmad. And the book is just so beautiful. About 27,000 hadiths in it, so bigger than Bukhari, Muslim. It's heavy, 13 volumes or something in the new edition. You would risk a sort of lower back pain if you tried to carry the whole thing. Um, but what's characteristic about this book, other than that, unlike, say, the Sahih of Bukhari, is that those other books are often arranged according to subject. A Musnad is a collection of hadith that is arranged according to the name of the companion who narrated that hadith. And he actually begins with the ten uh, companions who are guaranteed paradise while they still live, the Ashara Mubashara, Mubasharina Bil Jannah. Then he goes on through all of the Sahaba, so there's Musnad of Aisha and a Musnad of Abu Huraira, and that makes it a little bit specialised, difficult to use. You can pick up Bukhari and say, well, let me see some hadiths about Wudu, and there they are. Of course, if you want to know how to do wudu, you look at a book of fiqh because you might misunderstand the hadith. Um, but in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, 
If you want to find a hadith about wudu, <laughs> you have to find well, the new edition, which has a lot of uh, indexes, and then you can look it up, but it's kind of, it takes some time. So it's a very specialized scholar's work. It's kind of encyclopedic, but according to a specialized principle for those for whom knowledge of the isnad is vital, and those whose memorization is so amazing that they will actually remember hadiths by the isnad. Ah, oh, this is the hadith of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. And they'll think that before they actually think of the subject of, of the hadith. You can hardly find such people nowadays. Uh, but this is how they were with their amazing eidetic memory. So it's a, a recollection of a time of gigantic uh, scholarly erudition and wisdom. And it is a book that, that continues to uh, be a, a vital treasury of uh, the, the prophetic sunnah. So uh, we've really come to the end of this uh, quick visit to the life of Imam Ahmad, which was a quiet scholar's life, apart from the, the great tumult of the time of the, the fitna. Um, but the important thing to bear in mind is that we need to push away the conventional stereotype that says this is the beginning of stupid fundamentalism in Islam and a rejection of rationality and compassion. On the contrary, this is a highly spiritual person and his madhab was very often the madhab of the Sufis subsequently, who is maybe the greatest best known Sufi in Baghdad, Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, who is Hanbali in his doctrine and in his fiqh, one of the greatest early Sufis of what's now Afghanistan, Khwaja Abdullah Ansari of Herat, a Hanbali, the first Sufi tafsir in Persian is by Rashid al-Din Maybudi, a Hanbali. <laughs> so yeah, we need to get out of this idea that this is something that's, that's form, formalistic, legalistic, exoteric, uninterested in the living heart of religion. It, it's, Simply not the case. There is always in Islam a very close symbiosis between the Ahl al-Hadith, the real Hadith scholars, and a kind of prophetic devotion and a love of the awliya. And when you think about it, you couldn't really separate the two. A mark of real love for Hadith is a love for the awliya and those whose lives are transformed in this holy and beautiful way by uh, recollection of the Chosen One, sallallahu alayhi wa So, uh, uh, that essentially is the story, and we just have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the current misunderstandings of the way of Imam Ahmad, which are a kind of compound ignorance based on a misunderstanding of the nature of the hadith and the nature of how we read hadith and the, the, the nature of ikhtilaf and difference of opinion is in Islam, that those misunderstandings are overcome, inshallah, so that the beauty and the ironic inclusivity of classical Sunni Islam, which these Imams worked so hard to maintain and defend, is restored again. So that being Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jama'ah is once again this beautiful, spiritual, inclusive, authentic thing that genuinely conserves the reality of the prophetic Sunnah rather than just certain poorly understood aspects of its form. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on Imam Ahmad and grant us the benefit of understanding the life of Imam Ahmad and bless all of the true Hanbalis in this age and make us all lovers of the Hadith and love of the true Fatwa, insha'Allah. Barakallahu feekum, wal'afu minkum, wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Cambridge Muslim College, training the next generation of Muslim thinkers.